Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, February 11th, we're studying Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Jesus' stinging rebuke of the Pharisees and the scribes leads him into further teaching concerning what truly makes a person clean or unclean. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Kyle Meetsner. Pastor Meetsner serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Anchorage, Alaska. Pastor Meetsner, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hi, great. Thanks. Wonderful to be here. So we get started this morning. Let's talk a little context. This text, I think, really just flows nicely from what we looked at yesterday. What do we need to remember from yesterday's text and from anything in the Gospel of Mark as a whole that'll help us with what we got today? Well, uh, yesterday he is talking uh, to the Pharisees and they are criticizing him um, because their his disciples are not walking in accordance with the tradition of the elders and they are not washing their hands before they eat. And which I, I don't know, I think this is somewhat amusing, especially right now. It's like, can you even imagine a world in which people don't wash their hands, one, and then two, don't wash their hands before they eat? It's just <laughs> Breaking all the yeah, rules I, here. <laughs> every rule is being broken. But, uh, you know, it's like uh, I have three small children at home, and, and that, that's part of our tradition before dinner <laughs> is hounding them to wash their hands. But, um, but it, one of the interesting things about this, though, is that the Pharisees – have they they have come up with all these traditions that quite simply are not in the Bible. Um, they they have they have some roots in the scriptures, but but they just build on them and build on them and build on them. And so Jesus comes along. And he's like, well, that's not going to make you clean. Um, and so yeah, they, they're very unhappy with Jesus because he's not following the tradition of the elders. And Jesus is just like, you guys are missing the point. Um, and now there's this whole entire narrative in the, the first, what, um, I guess, third of Mark or so. It's just what is clean and what is unclean? Because Jesus is going around. He is touching people who are ritually unclean. He is uh, touching the sick people. He is touching lepers. He is going to people with demons. Uh, I believe he even touches a a, a dead person. Um, And and people who are bleeding come to Jesus and and touch him even. So, um, which by the way, according to Leviticus, does actually make you unclean. Um, I think that there's an assumption when we see uncleanness in the scriptures that that is synonymous with being sinful, but it's not always. There are some sinful things that can make you unclean, but uh, by and large, it just means that you're unclean. And these rules are actually really good for us. Um, The Lord gives us these categories of clean and unclean, and, and guess what? (laughs) <laughs> Pastor Apple, uh, every single human being from the priest and the high priest to the the lowest, you know, bleeding leper, every single one of them is unclean and in need of constant purification. God does not distinguish our cleanliness or uncleanliness based on who we are or aren't, uh, you're all unclean <laughs> and God himself is the only thing, the only, um, he's the only point of reference for what is actually clean. 
So, and we kind of think about it um, another way that, that what I do is what makes me clean or unclean, but it really, God is the only one. And, and our own cleanliness is actually meant to bring us closer to, to God. So we think about this in the old Testament. Um, you can't go into the temple if you're unclean, you have to be cleansed. And the good news is that these are mostly very temporary things. The Lord actually provides methods for people to be cleaned as well. Hmm. So it's, so it's in the midst of all those things that, that Jesus um, kind of directly addresses this and, and sort of calls them out on, on missing the point. You know, Hmm. it's like, I mean, yeah, guess what? Your washing of your hands are not washing of your hands, which by the way, like they don't, they don't have soap really like we have back then. So they're washing of their hands before they're eating a sandwich or whatever, which, well, they didn't have sandwiches either, but uh, <laughs> I don't know before they're eating a uh, uh, falafel or whatever. Lamb. Uh, lamb. Yes. <laughs> they're, like it's not actually to clean their hands because like they don't really understand that stuff. It's more of a, it's a ritual thing. Mm-hmm. And at, for the most part, and this is what we see, you know, at the wedding at Cana, they got these big old jars there and you, you basically dip your hands into the jar and maybe you get the dirt off, but there's no like antiseptic property to this. And if anything, it might be like making it, worse um so yeah it's it is it is a ritual thing it's not actually cleaning anything um it'll get some surface dirt off but really it it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't actually clean the hands and it does not certainly um clean your soul either so all right. Well, with with that, there, there's tons of things that I think we can explore just from, from what you've already brought out. I'm going to go ahead and read the text for us so that we have that in our minds as we think about these things. Again, Jesus has just finished addressing the Pharisees and the scribes concerning this matter of cleanliness that they've brought up to him. And the text continues in Mark 7, 14. And he, Jesus, called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. That's the text for today, Mark 7 verses 14 through 23. Pastor Meitzner, uh, before we deal specifically with the text, although it, it's certainly involved, one of the things you mentioned as you were introducing was that you know, you've know you got the Pharisees and the scribes who have all these traditions that simply are not in the Bible, but this matter of clean and unclean has shown up in the Gospel of Mark already in the way that Jesus touches people, particularly lepers, the, the dead girl in Mark chapter 5, the the woman with the issue of blood in that same account. And those things, the touching of a leper or the touching of a a dead person or a touching of a bleeding person, those things do come from the Bible. And Jesus seems to, well, it just seems like he breaks all the rules in in a lot of places. There are places where he keeps them too, but sometimes it it seems like he's, he's just breaking the rules. Some of them, these oral traditions, which, you know, he, he talked about that in the text we looked at yesterday and, and said, you're putting the tradition above the word of God. Okay. I got no problem with that. But when it comes to some of these other things, and in this one, you know, he's going to declare all foods clean, which again, that's coming from the old Testament. How do we, how do we grapple with that? Yeah. I mean, I guess, spoiler alert, 
<laughs> Jesus Christ is the only clean thing on the face of the earth. He cannot be tainted by by the uncleanliness which he encounters. So when he touches uh, the dead person, um, his or where does this? It says that with uh, the woman who touches the hem of his garment, that the power goes out from him. Right? We're not polluting Jesus. Mm. He's actually spreading his cleanliness and his his life to the polluted and the dying rest of the world. I mean, that's why he's doing this stuff <laughs> because because he knows. He's like, and 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 in some way too, he's also like, um. I actually wrote those rules and I know why they're there and I am going to um, raise this person from the dead. I'm going to heal this person. Um, and there is also another way where you can look at it though, where Jesus exchanges his cleanliness for our uncleanliness too. Um, he does take on the sin of the world he becomes the sin of the world. He who knew no sin became sin itself. So um, there's kind of two different ways we could look at that. Either he's impollutable because he is pure and he is holy, or that he's also uh, taking on our uncleanness into himself and taking that all to the cross to die with it once and for all. Every sin is nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ, and every single bit of uncleanness that we had— uh, dies there with him and then we are clothed with his righteousness in this uh, great exchange that takes place there mm. so it he either way he he cannot be too tainted uh, by our our wretchedness uh, that's a very helpful explanation. I really think it's going to give us a, a good handle on the things that Jesus says in this text so the text starts he's He's addressed the scribes and Pharisees, and they seem to fade into the background for this text. I'm not sure if we're supposed to understand them overhearing this, perhaps, but he says specifically, or Mark tells us specifically, that Jesus calls the people to him to address them. And he, he lays it out, I think, fairly directly when he says there's nothing outside a person that can go into him and defile him. Instead, it's the things that come out of him. That defile him. So we, we've got these themes of cleanness, uncleanness, defilement. Help us to understand this opening statement from Jesus. Yeah, well, yeah, so he's talking to the Pharisees beforehand. And, you know, it always kind of seems like there's, there's like someone kind of hanging around on the periphery, hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the interesting things to me about Jesus and the Pharisees is that they do, it's like they are interested in him. And he's never on the run from them. He is, he is always eating with them. You know, we always talk about how Jesus, of course, eats with all the sinners and stuff. But he also eats with the Pharisees, which are like the actual bad guys, you know. But they, they seem genuinely curious sometimes. I don't, I, I mean, I know that they're out to get him, but they are like, all right, seriously, why are your disciples not? doing this stuff what is going on i i you know and on some level i do have some great sympathy for them because like we said the rules the rules are not from nowhere um they're missing the point of them but this is what has been handed down to them from generation to generation and you know when we see in the new testament in the book of Acts, you know, they're they're trying to figure out if the Gentiles need to be circumcised or not. And you and I know, we're like, are, are you kidding me? Like, of course not. Um, but this is what they've been given. And so it, it is actually challenging. And so, and it's not only the Pharisees who believe this stuff, but it's also uh, the people in general. They're maybe not as stringent about the rules or anything, um, but he does call all the people to him and wants to make sure that they understand this, which is why he says, hear me and understand. Um, yeah. Now, is, as we know, like there, there is a quite extensive list 
I love reading the book of Leviticus because there are all sorts of just crazy rules in there. They look crazy to us, but uh, all the different animals you can or can't eat. And uh, so these people, you know, like they've got the list on their refrigerator and it says like, well, you can't eat this and you can't eat this. Um, don't eat, don't eat uh, uh, all sorts of lizards or don't eat a chameleon. Did you know that? Um, I'm glad to know that now. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've never been tempted and now <laughs> I'm even less tempted. There's also all these uh, categories of uh, all sorts of bugs that you can or can't eat. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with not eating any of them, but, but these people all think that their, their righteousness essentially comes from what they eat or don't eat. And, and again, this list is very, very long, by the way, um, uh, giraffes were declared to be kosher in 2008. So, wow. That's Yeah. They're still kind of, they're still figuring these rules out. Wow. So, so, so yeah, a text like this is not uh, inap- inapplicable today. Oh, no. Yeah. It, this is like, this is exactly kind of the issues that are still going on in modern Judaism today. And it, it's easy for me to make light of this too, saying like, well, obviously you shouldn't be eating a chameleon, but they're very concerned about keeping the rules. And and they kind of miss what it is behind them. Well, and now, if I interest- just let me just jump in real quick about that very yeah. concern because it, put it in the context of what had happened in terms of the exile and how big of a, a problem that had been for the people. And when you look, for example, in some of the post-exilic literature in in Ezra and Nehemiah. And how very concerned they were about, we don't want this to happen to us again. We don't want to be kicked out again. Again, not that they, not to say that they're right, but you can understand where they're coming from and why this is so shocking to them when Jesus does these things. Totally. Yeah. Um, and and it, it, it's a great blessing that you and I are aware that, that, that this is actually true. Um. So in Leviticus, we're never actually given a reason for why these foods are unclean. They, they, the Lord never really explains it. But there's something really interesting, though, is that you are not allowed to eat something that would not be used for a sacrifice. Hmm. So our dietary restrictions, essentially, are the same as the Lord's dietary restrictions. Um, so that we only eat things that can be sacrificed in the temple. Hmm. And, and that's really, that's the only real reason why this list even exists. Uh, so the whole purpose then was still to make Israel uh, a part of this, this, this covenant with, with Yahweh. Uh, to make them part of Yahweh himself. And we know that they are a kingdom of priests, right? They are they are set apart from the rest of the nations. And so we would they would not even look at someone who eats a pig as being like gross or anything. They're just they're not a part of the people of Yahweh. So we eat what God eats, or he eats what we eat. And yeah, it's 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 really interesting, though, that there's no like, there's no innate badness to the pig, um, or in, any innate goodness to the giraffe. Indeed, all things are good and and clean, as Jesus uh, has has told us here. So, I guess, um, well, can I? And, and I'm going to try to to connect a couple dots in my own mind with that about the that the f- clean foods are the same ones that can be sacrificed. And and so that that what the Lord receives as a sacrifice, that's what I can eat. Such that it's it's not about the food itself making me clean or unclean, but rather the food that I'm eating shows the connection that I have with the one true God. 
And, yes. and that's what actually makes me clean is by being connected to the one who is clean, which I think, again, for me, that, that really connects to back to what you were saying about Jesus being the only one on the face of the planet at this moment who is actually clean. And, and so my cleanliness or defilement is not based on what's going into my body, but it's rather based on, am I connected to Jesus by faith? Yes. Yes, exactly. It is. It's so wonderful when you see that too, that it's, this is not, you know, like God is not out to ruin our fun. That's not his goal in giving us the commandments and and instituting these things. It's actually to bring us closer to himself and to restore what has been lost with, with us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Is can we talk about these two textual notes here? There's actually two issues sure, in this text. Too. Sure. Let's just get this out of the way. That's right. Okay. Because so. they are interesting. There in in your Bibles, there you will find several verses that are just missing. So Mark 716 is not in the main text of your scriptures, unless you have a King James Bible. It's still in there. But you'll have a little footnote there. Um, it just says some manuscripts add verse 16. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And and you'll find these things all throughout the New Testament uh, where we'll have different kind of manuscript evidence and, and based on uh, basically what like real smart people uh, have concluded, we'll, we'll either relegate them to a footnote or just kind of leave them out altogether or we'll put them in brackets sometime. Uh, I think John six is one of those chapters that that it's not in a whole lot of the early manuscripts, but we put it in in brackets. The story of the um, the woman caught in adultery. But yeah, I just I want people to know you don't need to be scandalized by this. Uh, the church is not trying to hide anything from you, and uh, and your pastor certainly know that these things exist and why they were um, quote left out. So there's also another interesting thing in this text that is very, very rare. I think it it occurs maybe one other place where the gospel writer actually inserts his own thought here. It, it, in let's see, verse 19, mm. in, you'll see in the the parentheses there. Thus he declared all foods clean. But this, I love this. This is it's really interesting. In order to <laughs> tell us plainly what Jesus means. Mark inserts his own thought there. And this is actually a controversial thing too. I found uh, some commentators think that, that that's not at all possible even and that the gospel writer would never do that. Hmm. Uh, but the, the, the grammar does seem to be that Mark inserts his own thought here. Thus he declared all foods clean. And now, and this is wonderful, all foods are clean. Uh, Mark is supposedly um, Mark is writing from a, a, a the view of Peter. Mark and Peter travel around together, and so the Gospel of Mark is also kind of the Gospel uh, of Peter that he has been preaching and teaching. And Mark assembles it into his Gospel, and we know that Peter had a very difficult time with this, didn't he? Yeah. About um, the dietary laws. And again, I have nothing to sympathy for these people because they've been trying their whole entire lives to keep them as 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 good as they could, and they were stringent about this. And remember this: uh, the, it's the craziest scene. Peter is on top of this house, and the Lord re- reveals to him, drops down, it shows him a sheet, it lowers it three times, and and he sees every animal, and. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ tells Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter's like, hey, come on. I'm not eating all that stuff. There's, uh, there's chameleons in there. That's right. uh, those, those are unclean. And uh, Jesus says, do not call unclean what I have made clean. Um, and, and again, declares all foods to be clean. And so you can see that kind of. Uh, you can see Peter sneaking in here, too, through Mark's pen uh, in this wonderful little story. And, of course, that's how, you know, Peter was there and he heard all this stuff. 
he knows what's going on. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a really cool note. But again, I don't want anyone to be scandalized by these things. And you know what? Um, most of the time, whenever you hear about the gospel of this, that, and whoever that like got kicked out of the Bible, odds are that your pastor knows about these things and probably has it on the shelf in his office and can tell you why that thing is not in the Bible, whether it's the gospel of Thomas or, you know, the secret gospel of Jesus wife or whatever bizarre thing they'll come up with this Easter. Um, but yeah, we do know about these things and, and you don't need to be scandaled by issues like this. That's a, that's a very helpful reminder because it is, it's easy to, to just be reading through and, Oh, there isn't a 16 there. What happened? And, and there are those uh, who do not believe that would use those in an attempt to discredit what we've been given as Christians in God's word. And, and yeah, your, your pastor knows and, and he knows why it's not there. And he knows why it is that you can, in fact, trust the word of God that we've been given in the Holy Scriptures. As, as you well said, Pastor Meisner, we're going to pick up more of this conversation on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFU. We're looking at Mark chapter 7 with Pastor Kyle Meisner. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, February 11th. We're looking at Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. We have Pastor Kyle Meetsner with us. He serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Anchorage, Alaska. Pastor Meetsner, prior to the break, we looked at Jesus' initial teaching to the people. He's called them to himself and has told them that it's not what goes into a person that defiles, it's what comes out. He now goes into the house. The people are left behind. It's just Jesus and his disciples, and they ask him for an explanation. Jesus is pretty harsh with them in his response. Uh, why Why this change in scene all of a sudden, and even a little bit of a change in style? The disciples ask Jesus for an explanation of the parable that was given to the large group, and now Jesus is a lot more direct with his inner circle, his 12. Why that difference? Well, it's interesting. In um, in Mark, at least, Jesus teaches to crowds in parables and then to the disciples in kind of explaining those things and, and, and very specific teachings. And, you know, there's that's an interesting detail in 17, too, when he had entered the house and left the people. We're not even they don't don't they don't tell us whose house this is. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just like a house somewhere. I, I'd love to know whose house that is. It's it's neat, but yeah, he does give more private instruction to to the the disciples. Now, it's interesting to me too is that I also didn't even recognize this thing that he says as a parable. I mean, did you? Right. No, I, I. That was another question I had too. It it doesn't really sound like a parable, but that's how the disciples understand it. Maybe that's indicative of their lack of understanding i don't know i'm I'm not sure how it's a parable it certainly doesn't take the what you and i would normally think of as a parable i think yeah there's no characters in it or anything yeah it's no but nevertheless yeah no the the scripture does call it a parable um but and, and so he goes on to explain it and and maybe that's just to tell us that our definition of parables is is pretty narrow right perhaps yeah um, when it is a very wide genre of teaching that, that Jesus uses. But yeah, Jesus, I mean, he seems, I don't know. I mean, he seems irritated with them about this, I guess. And and in some way, because he cites Isaiah right before this, he's like, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
they they keep all the rules, but but they're not actually uh, they don't they don't love me, and it's it's really interesting. So here you have like the incarnate Lord who's been dealing with this for well since before Abraham, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so he's like, ah, man. I, you know, I was trying to help you guys, and and you you turned it into an idol. You know, you turned the dietary laws into idols, and it, so he he goes on to define this and and tell them what it means. It's like, look, I don't care what you eat; it is not going to make you unclean. Now, there's this in verse nineteen. It doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach, okay? And so there is, in the ancient world, this this classification between the cardia, your heart, and your, and your coilia, your organs, and your stomach. Um, kind of, you know, as Shakespeare says, this mortal coil. And the things that go into your body, it's like they're almost parallel systems, Um your heart is yourself and your essential personality. And then um, the, the organs, they're your, they're, 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 that's your body. And these things do have something to do with one another. But, uh, yeah, if you eat a cheeseburger, you are not defiled. Um, and now in the ESV here in, in 19, for some reason, I don't know why they translate this as – one of the one of the fun parts about like learning Greek is you learn all the like scandalous parts of the Bible, <laughs> um, but in the ESV it tells us since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled. And the Greek it actually says like pushed out into the toilet. So he's being pretty um, pretty direct with them. It's like look that that stuff's gonna come out of you. And it's just going to the toilet. That's not gonna. How is that gonna make you unclean? Um, but then the very next verse in 20, he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. And that he uses that same word. It's really, it's, it, it's, it's almost like you get this definition of actually being a potty mouth. And he's like, yeah, okay. So what you have pushed out into the toilet will not make you unclean, but what you push out from your mouth that will defile you. And you think about all these things, too, because he goes on with this big list of, of, of sins, which, by the way, the, the Didache uh, has, I believe it's almost the same exact list in this order uh, as the definition of the way of death. The Didache is one of the it's very early um, writing. It's, it's basically the church's first catechism. Mm-hmm. We had lost it for like 1800 years we knew it existed and then uh some monk in a library in i think greece found it one day i was like oh well there it is i knew i'd put it somewhere but um it starts out with there's two ways the way of life and the way of death Mm -hmm. and and this is the way of death that that is described here so jesus christ has actually come to bring the way of life Mm -hmm. and all these other things though uh, which come out of us, which we push out um, in a disgusting way. These are, this is the way of death mm-hmm. and, and they will defile you mm-hmm. uh, all, all of this immorality and whatnot. It's these evil things that come from within. Mm-hmm. They will defile you. So yeah, sin, sin's not just a bad idea. Huh. It's actually really bad for you and it's not good for anyone else either. Hmm. That uh, it's it's always, I think it's it's worth our while to see how in those places the scriptures will speak very graphically or very vividly when it's talking about just the grossness of sin. And, and and as you were describing, you know, the words that Mark actually uses here to record this, the words that Jesus speaks. Sure, that makes us a little uncomfortable, but I think it's it's worth our time to pay attention to that so that we would understand. That sin isn't just sort of like, oh, that's that's too bad, but it, it actually is is gross. 
it's disgusting. It's disgusting. Yeah. And, and that should be the, the way that we understand it. I'm, I'm reminded of, a, of the conversation I had on Sharper Iron. Oh, it's been a while ago now, but on Judges chapter three, where you get the, the account of Ehud killing the, the fat king of Moab, Moab. No. Yeah. Moab. I think that's right. He, he kills the fat king and the, the fat like sucks in the blade and, and his attendants think he's on the toilet. And it's, it's just a really gross picture. But the, the conversation we had then was like, this is a intended by the author of Judges to give us a picture of the disgusting nature of sin, that we should see idolatry and sin as absolutely horrifying to us, just gross. And I think that the similar thing is is coming here from Jesus with the language that, that he uses. And and perhaps the the even more horrifying thing of all of this is that this disgusting evil, it's not coming from the outside. Jesus says, but actually it's coming from inside of me. It invites some reflection on where does evil, where's the evil coming from? Yeah. So it is, you're right. A lot of times we want to blame someone else for our own sin, right? And this is all the way back to the beginning, right? Mm, yeah. Um, hey, what'd you do? Well, she gave me this uh, fruit and I ate it. The woman that you gave me, God, it's like, oh, no, well, that's not good. You can't blame anyone else for your own sin. Your sin is yours. Now, other sin, other people's sin may get on you as well. Um, it, it, it can, uh, it can, other people's sin can hurt you too. And, and it can just well up and, and get whipped up. But yeah, it, it does come from within you. And, you know, we always think that our hearts are good and pure. And, and Jesus doesn't say that the only thing that comes out of us is evil, you know, but he's saying these things do come out of your heart, all of them, and they will defile you. Um, one of my favorite, um, he's not a church father, but uh, the venerable Bede, he was a, he was a, a monk or in uh, Jero, England, and basically like just sat and wrote he wrote this awesome piece if anyone's interested in like medieval church history beads uh, ecclesiastical history of the english people is like just fascinating it's the story of how england became um christian basically but he also writes about a bunch of other things and he's kind of a, a uh, not a jack of all trades but like a king of all trades when it comes to the theological disciplines the venerable bead check him out he's awesome but he he writes this he's commenting on this and he says that um this is an answer to those who consider that evil thoughts are simply injected by the devil and that they do not spring from our own will he can add strength to our bad thoughts and inflame them but he cannot originate them now i don't know i don't know if i find that comforting or horrifying mm. that the devil is out there indeed prowling like a roaring lion, but he cannot inject um, evil thoughts into my heart. You know, instead they come from my own self. So you know, I don't know if this is <laughs> comforting or horrifying. Um, it'd be perhaps easier to say that the devil put them there. The devil made me do it, you know, um, but it it also shows that I am the defiled person that needs to be made clean. I, not someone else. It's not Satan's fault. Now the devil can indeed uh, whip up our our own temptations and add strength to them and inflame them, as as Bede says. But uh, he does not initiate them. That comes from us. And yeah, it's uh, Tertullian, another church father, talks about this in a, his writing on patience. Um, and and he, he references this, this exact same thing here about um, when others ridicule, ridicule you or revile you. And then when we respond with uh, slander, and with pride and foolishness, these things 
it's like this like sin tornado that just uh or almost like the gululim in uh, jeremiah that that it just is complete defilement and it gets on everyone hmm. and you know and you look at this list for what comes out of the heart of man sexual morality theft murder adultery coveting wickedness deceit sensuality envy slander pride foolishness and you kind of wonder like oh, okay so what hope do i have of actually ever being clean hmm. in and of myself I've got nothing, hmm. nothing at all. Hmm. Yeah, you feel, you feel. I mean, after reading it, especially if you read it out loud, you, you feel unclean. You feel dirty just by reading that list of words, knowing that that's what's there within. That's that's where this starts. And I, I can't blame, I can't blame the devil. The devil made me do it. That's not the excuse that Jesus gives. Not at all. The way that I, I think I've said it sometimes in preaching and teaching is that the, and I, I think this fits with what you were sharing from the venerable bead, that the the devil will find an ally in our own sinful nature, that that, that sinful nature that's within us, the devil finds, finds it an ally and, and he inflames those passions, but it remains our fault. Uh, we don't get to say, well, we don't get to say the devil made me do it. And I don't even think we, we get to say, you know, we can't just say, oh, that's that's my sinful nature. I, I couldn't help myself. I don't think we get that excuse either. No. You never get to blame someone else for your sins. There's always, I'm always like uh, a little bit frightened on Sunday mornings when we do corporate confession and absolution. Um, it's really easy to confess other people's sins, right? Um because I'm a, I'm a theoretical sinner, of course, Yeah. but have you seen what they did? You know, and it's not actually given to you to confess other people's sins or even to bring them to light. You have enough to deal with on your own. I think that one of the things about Jesus concern here too, is that there are people going around thinking that they are indeed clean and righteous. Yeah because they're eating the right things, but they are sinning from their heart just incredibly, but, but thinking that because they're eating the right things and washing their hands, that they're actually clean and righteous um, and holy, but that yeah, he wants to deal. Jesus doesn't just deal with like the external things. He deals with the whole person and he takes all of it on. Um, yeah, there's, well, there's this wonderful story that was found in an ancient garbage pile in a town called Oxyrhynchus, which is in uh, Southern Egypt, which I think is called Upper Egypt. But, um, it's this wonderful little story that it's, 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 it's Jesus is in the temple with this Pharisee named Levi. And, and it's, this story is written on a little piece of vellum, which is kind of like leather. And it was some sort of amulet that someone would have kept on themselves. And I, I like to think that maybe this was given at their baptism, but um, the Pharisee is in the temple and is, and is saying to Jesus, he's like, um, you're not clean. You didn't follow all the rules quite right. He says, the Pharisee says to Jesus, I'm clean. I bathed in the pool of David. I went down into the pool and I came out on the other end and I put on white clothes and they were clean. And then I came and looked at these holy vessels. And then Jesus says to him, woe to blind people who do not see. You have washed in the gushing waters that dogs and pigs are thrown into day and night. And when you washed yourself, you scrubbed the outer layer of skin. He goes on to describe what this outer layer of skin has done. But my disciples and I, whom you say have not washed, we have washed in the waters of eternal life that come from the God of heaven. And that's where the, the, uh, this, this manuscript cuts off. It, there, there was more of it, but, but it's lost to history. But it's, it's this wonderful little story. I love it. Um, you can do all the ritual cleansings and still be filthy 
But unless you are washed in the waters of eternal life that come from the God of heaven, you won't be clean. And so that's the thing is that like when you're when you're in all this stuff, you're just like, what hope is there? Is there hope at all? But then you're like, oh, yeah, actually, there is hope. Uh, you can be clean. And, and Jesus, who is the clean one, who is the sinless one, gives this gift to you. Uh, that, that takes us back to where we were talking near the beginning about the need to be connected to the one, the only one who is clean and holy and whose cleanliness and holiness is unable to be defiled such that when he goes to those who are unclean and he touches them, his cleanliness, his holiness is imparted to them rather than, than the other way around. Or as you said, that idea of the great exchange too, that Jesus freely gives his holiness and cleanliness in exchange for our unholiness, for our sinfulness, for our uncleanness. It, it's a, a, just such a fantastic, powerful image. As, as you're talking about, and I think this has kind of been hanging in the background of my mind, uh, both with yesterday's text and today's, Yesterday, we talked a lot about the washing, and it's not about the washing of hands. You mentioned that at the beginning of today's chat, Pastor, Meis, Pastor Meisner, and then the, the thought of eating and things going in. Well, in the Christian church, you know, we, have, we have a washing with water and the word, as we confess in the catechism, and we have an eating as well, things, things going in. And we, we confess some rather spectacular things about, about this washing of holy baptism, and, and even more spectacular things, perhaps, about the, the eating and drinking that happened in the sacrament of the altar. How do those play into this whole conversation about cleanness, uncleanness, and outward and inward, and what Jesus is saying here in Mark chapter 7? Yeah, well, so let's see. We, we can go back also to Adam and Eve, as well. So if eating is not the problem, then what was the problem with their eating? Hmm. Well, the problem was not the eating. The problem is um, the unbelief. Okay. Uh, the problem is um, un unfaith, I guess. They're... The problem is not that they ate from the tree, but that they didn't believe Yahweh and thought that they knew better. Um, that that's what's behind this. And in the same way, that's how the sacraments work. They're not magic. Uh, they are received in faith and by faith. The belief that is there, that this is actually Jesus' true body and blood given and shed for me for the forgiveness of my sins. That is, that is the saving work there. And, in in some circles, and this was a huge problem that led to the Reformation, there's this idea, we ex opere operato, by the work worked. So just by eating the thing, just by consuming the Eucharist, you're good. And Luther comes along, and, and this is great. He's like, no, it's actually like you receive this by faith. You receive the washing of holy baptism. By faith, again, it's not what goes into you, uh, but this is received by faith. And, and, and we look to Christ in all of this, and he's the one who's doing all of the cleaning. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it is not the mere eating, kind of as we say with the washing, right? It's not mere water. It's not plain water. It's water combined with the word of God. Okay, and and with with faith, and that is what makes it a holy baptism, and that is what makes it a holy Eucharist. Um, so, yeah, it, these things are received by faith. It's not a it's not a mechanical operation, or else or else we just run around with a fire hose baptizing everyone and wouldn't care if they ever actually heard any of the words. Uh, this is also why you don't you don't go to the hospital and just commune everyone who's dying and has no idea what it is um, because that's not how it works uh, faith is there the, the trust that this is actually um, good for us and, and so in that way the original sin that was incurred by eating unfaithfully is undone and forgiven in all of us by the eating that is done in faith uh, and by faith. 
So, I mean, a, a text like this, uh, we shouldn't try to play a text like this where Jesus says, hey, what goes into you is just going to come out. That's not what makes you clean or unclean. We shouldn't try to, to put this text against texts that hold the sacrament of the altar in high regard. Because he's I just, wouldn't. Well, good. That's good. I wouldn't either. And I don't, I don't think we should because, and in fact, if we understand Jesus properly that, and, and connect these things to receiving what the Lord has given in faith, then it actually should drive us toward the sacrament of the altar, not because we happen to be chewing something at the moment, but because of the promise that Christ is attached to it, that it is his body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Yeah, exactly. That's if there's no promise, then there's no point in it. Right. And again, as you, as you said, the, the catechism gives us that question in, in both of them. You know, how can how can water do such great things? Well, it's certainly it's not just water. It's the word of God in and with the water. And, and how can eating and drinking do these great things? Again, not just eating and drinking, but the words written here. So we're, we're constantly be, being driven back to the words to the promises of Jesus, which which are received by faith. It, it is the, the faith that apprehends the promise of God that that holds on to it, that clings to it with all with all its might. Pastor Meester, we've got just under four minutes here on the morning. Uh, concluding thoughts on the text, wrap things up for us, help us to see the good news of Christ crucified and risen for our cleanliness in this text. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, honestly, here's the deal. It's like on your own, you're lost. These things are going to, they are going to come out of your mouth. You do have real sins to repent of and, and they're severe and you're going to think that the devil put them in you, but it was you all along who is responsible for these things, but do not lose heart because you have a Lord who is also a real, uh, forgiving lord you have a lord who takes your defilement and actually uh, cleans you up like he's capable of this so you have real sins well you should confess those real sins and and even more believe that that jesus christ is the sinless one who can take that all away from you and at the end of the day Rejoice in whatever food that the Lord has given you to eat <laughs> and not worrying that one tiny bit of it is going to is going to defile you. So, I mean, it, we all know there are plenty of people out there who still think you can't eat certain things or else or else you're you're not pleasing to the Lord. And it's wild. We didn't talk about this yet, but uh, I just I mean, it was probably about 10 years ago now or something, but. The pastor at the largest church in America preached a sermon on why you can't eat uh, pork and why you can't eat shellfish. And, and I mean, like, seriously, this the pastor of the largest church in America is, is binding the consciences of people. At, no way. This is the, the Lord has set you free. He has cleaned you. And that is a gift that he has given to you. Uh, so, hey, stand up and look around. Like the world is is full of of clean things for you to rejoice in and, and indeed even to eat. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it kind of opens up the world to us, I think, and to live this life of freedom. Um, yeah. Pastor Kyle Meetsner is the pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Anchorage, Alaska, helping us this morning with Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Pastor Meetsner, thanks for being our guest today. Great to be here. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Mark chapter 7 or the gospel of Mark as a whole, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.